Hey everybody. This is the week two lecture for Jesus and the Gospels. Welcome back. I hope that by now you have watched the uh, video, which was actually an audio interview with Dr. Bart Ehrman. Uh, it was recorded off of NPR. And I also hope that you have read both chapters two and three from our textbook, Jesus and the Gospels. This lecture probably isn't going to make much sense unless, you, unless you've read those two chapters, so please read them first. These two chapters go together because they frame the argument that we're going to be examining for the rest of the semester. In the first place is the primary question that we are addressing. Did Jesus exist, and if so, how? The second chapter, which is really the third chapter of your book, examines the very fundamental history of how we have answered that question or tried to answer that question for the last 300 or so years. What I want you to gain from these two chapters is an understanding that we are just peering into a very dense and thick conversation that's been going on in the halls of academia around the world for hundreds of years. We're not going to come out of this as scholars able to contribute to the argument, but I hope that you'll come out with a better understanding of just what has been said when it comes to Jesus studies. Now, first, let's remember the primary question. Did Jesus exist? And if so, how? This unit demands that you interpret and examine your own theology of the Bible. Now, I've spent a lot of time talking about how your theology is not what's important in this class. I remind you that the part of you that may have been offended or uh, tickled by the Black Jesus video is not the part of you that we're addressing in this class. The part of you that we're trying to get at is your intellect, your academic understanding of what the Gospels say and what kind of Jesus they portray. You need, though, to examine what you believe about the Bible. First, if you come to the Bible with an understanding that it is an infallible, inerrant Word of God, you may find discomfort in examining the Scriptures in the way we're going to. We're not going to do anything evil to them. But if you come to this course with the understanding that the Bible is too holy to be examined with academic rigor, then you're going to have a bad time. Rather, we need to understand that the Bible is a collection of documents that has been organized and stitched together over thousands of years that has been seen and in some cases edited by hundreds and thousands of people. If we come to the Bible thinking that it is unassailable, that it is too sacred to treat with academic rigor, then we can't get very far in our study. For a long time, that attitude of the Bible is too holy to really study, the Bible is too sacred to actually pick apart and to be critical of, meant that we only had the Bible as a source of information about Jesus. To ask whether or not Jesus existed, which is our primary question in this unit, with nothing but the New Testament is silly and won't get us anywhere. Of course the New Testament assumes that Jesus existed. In fact, the New Testament goes to great lengths to communicate just how he existed and what his life was like. 
we need to be able to step back away from the scriptures to examine them as objectively as we can so that we can gain a better understanding of who the man Jesus is. Here's how I justify that as a pastor. What's more important if you are a Christian? The Bible or Jesus? Be careful that in your heart they are not the same thing because they are totally different objects. One, the Bible, is not the object of our faith. Rather, Jesus Christ is. So for those of you who are believers, be careful that you do not elevate the collected writings of those throughout history who have been faithful believers in God to the level of Godhood itself. So what about the Bible? I personally believe that the Bible is the inspired uh, Word of God and that it is an authoritative guide and rule for faith and practice. That's my personal belief about the Bible. But please remember, my beliefs and your beliefs are not at issue here. What we need to be able to do is step back, examine the Bible for what it actually says, then perhaps look beyond the pages of Scripture to see what others say about that starring character in the Gospels, Jesus. Let's work with the idea that the Bible is a collection of historical documents that, depending on your perspective, may or may not be divinely inspired. We will be spending our time examining the Gospels as documents that can help us better understand the what and the why of their own origin and development, and through that, better understand the who of Jesus. One of the main characters you met in chapter 2 that I think deserves much more attention than the authors of your textbook give him is Josephus. Josephus is the most important non-Christian source of information on Jesus that we have. Josephus' writings have been studied and poured over for 2,000 years because he wrote from a perspective outside of Christianity, but about Christianity, specifically about the interaction between Christianity and Judaism. He was a very well-to-do author from the first century. He primarily wrote about issues of the Jewish nation, specifically a revolt that he participated in against Rome in the first century. Now, Rome, being the great powerful empire that it was, quickly squashed that revolution. It didn't really get anywhere. But Josephus continued to write about the revolt about the Jewish people, and included information about Jesus and the Christians. Not much, but enough that he has become a valuable asset to the study of first century Christianity and the study of Jesus. The works of Josephus offer us a simple case study in how we are going to eventually treat the Gospels themselves. Consider this. The stories and records that Josephus wrote down thousands of years ago have been valued by the church and by Christianity at large for that long length of time between the first century and now. Those writings have been in the hands of folks who would have preferred that Josephus had been even kinder to Christianity. Perhaps even that Josephus had shown the supremacy of Christianity over Judaism. We can see, as your authors helpfully pointed out, where other hands than Josephus's have edited his own works so that when Josephus does reference Jesus, he calls Jesus the Messiah. Josephus would have never called Jesus the Messiah 
because to Josephus, the Messiah would have been the one victorious over Rome. He would have been the very leader who would have succeeded in the revolt that failed in Josephus' own day. In his works, then, we can see the effects of that long span of time when many, many hands and eyes and editors were able to influence the development and spread of these writings. So about those Gospels, in chapter 2, you may have gotten discouraged as we read about different opinions on whether or not Jesus was real, whether or not early Christians just blatantly stole the creation and salvation narratives from other cultures and other religions. You may have been a little scandalized by what people are actually writing, not for comedic value, as in black Jesus, but in actual academic discourse. Can we trust the gospel authors? I think so. And I think the majority of scholarship agrees with me. Remember, the Gospels in the New Testament were not intended to be biographies, just as those authors were not intended to be treated as though they were writing scientific texts. We have to treat the Gospels as Gospels. They are at their heart edited for a point. They are stories told for a purpose. Mark has one intention. Matthew has another. John has something completely different in mind when he writes and edits his gospel. Keep in mind that these so-called distortions or these biases do not make them evil or deceptive. In fact, the very reality that these Gospels are still in our Bibles today is testimony to their truth. The very presence of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John testifies that the church has found value in them for 2,000 years. It is okay for us to see them as literature that has been edited, as Documents that were written to convince a certain audience of a certain thing about a certain man. We can, in our study of those Gospels, use other supporting materials to help us better understand. But are even those supporting materials reliable? Well, yes and no. They may be just as biased or distorted as any other document of the ancient world. We may encounter an author who relied on bad evidence or who relied on rumor to make his case about Jesus one way or the other. I am not advocating that we de-sanctify the scriptures And I'm certainly not advocating that we raise any supporting document to the level of Scripture. What I am suggesting is that supporting documents are useful in our study of the Gospels. Again, we are not studying the Bible to insult it. We're studying the Bible because it is our way, our most reliable source of information about Jesus.